the effect of AI is to make people smarter. You can think of AI as an amplifier of human intelligence. And when people are smarter, better things happen. People are more productive, happier, the um, economy strives, people make fewer mistakes because they have to make to plan uh, by being smarter. So this is really what characterizes us as humans, intelligence. And amplifying your intelligence can only have good effects. Now, there's no question that bad actors can use it for bad things. And then it's a question of whether there are more good actors than bad actors, and it's going to be my good AI against some bad AI or something like that. Wait, in, are computers intrinsically good? Are smartphones intrinsically good? Are keyboards intrinsically good? Or is just AI intrinsically good? Well, it's uh, the, effect, the effect of AI of amplifying human intelligence uh, is intrinsically good. But to some extent, computers already do this, even without AI. When you use, uh, uh, you know, simulators um, or high-performance computers to predict uh, climate and the weather, it makes us smarter, right? We use uh, computational models to predict what's going to happen. This is really the essence of intelligence, the ability to predict, and then to act on those predictions to uh, produce good outcomes. So that's already what we use computers for. Then they're at the moment not particularly smart. Um, although if you if you project ourselves back in the I don't know 17th century, what computers can do today, or what even they could do 20 years ago, would feel for a mathematician in the 17th century like being smart. Yeah. Um, and there has been constant discussions uh, over the last uh, six or seven decades the progress of, of, of computers, where people are simulating computers with uh, intelligence and the brain power and things like this. Um, so I think. It's already in the mindset of everyone that computers make, make us smarter. AI just makes us even more smarter. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. it's smart is not enough because you can make smart people uh, in charge of bad things, or bad habits, or bad behavior, or bad actions. And uh, we have always been saying in the history of mankind, smart people to intelligent people. So, therefore, the question we have here is uh, are people going to be individually and collectively aware of the dangers? Are companies going to be aware of the dangers? Mankind is facing the risk of suicide in the next three decades on the three dimensions I mentioned. Are we going to be all of us enough aware of it to use for the best of this technology? or to, be, to have a kind of begging neglect on the bad use of it. Are your company going to have a begging neglect? I provide tools, just do it, and it's not my role to do what to do, but what's your role thing. Or is it possible to have a, an evolution, an international charter that will uh, create a democratic constraint for bad evolution? It's difficult to think about doing it. But what I think is what is important at this crossroads where we are is to really develop the awareness of the dangers and the awareness of the days of the answer. I'm amazed at the numbers of startups and companies that have been amazing positive discoveries and research and projects on what I call economic of life. It's huge. But it's a race between the two. Uh, Unfortunately, short-term profit today is more in the economy of death than that of the More short-term profit in the oil companies than in the health companies or in EdTech, and that's what the uh, public sector can change. But this race between good future and bad future is here. And don't say, don't think that the best is always coming. If you look at mankind, if I can sum up the history of mankind, but a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. More good, more bad. More good, more bad. More good, more bad. More good, more bad. And now we are very high, and we become down, and then we come up. Yeah, I want you to respond to this, but one of the key elements of responding is understanding how powerful the AIs are today. And you are probably the only person in the world who has been in exactly the same spot for the past year. You were sort of more excited in some ways about the capacity of language, and now you are pouring a lot of cold water on the people who say that 
GPT-4 is sentient and GPT-5 will exceed all human knowledge. Explain what you think the limitations are, particularly of language models, and why you think, as you said, that they'll never be able to match human intelligence, even if trained until, I think you said, the heat death of the universe. Right. So yes, we made a lot of progress in AI, certainly in uh, perception over the last decade or so. Uh, speech recognition, image recognition, this kind, of, this kind of thing. Understanding language, that has made a lot of progress over the last uh, four or five years. Um, and then in recent times, the, the use of uh, large language models that are trained in a self-supervised manner, just to predict the next word in the text, trained on gigantic amounts of text. And we see this emergent property that they seem to acquire enough knowledge and, uh, and uh, to some extent, kind of superficial reasoning ability that they are useful as a writing aid, for example. But those systems uh, are still very limited. They don't have any understanding of the underlying reality of the real world. Uh, because they're purely trained on text, massive amounts of text, but this may surprise, surprise many people in the audience, but most of human knowledge has nothing to do with language, and certainly all of animal knowledge has nothing to do with language. And so that part of the human experience is not captured by any of those AI systems. They don't have any physical intuition, uh, they don't know how the world works, and that uh, basically stops them from being able to plan actions in the world. So that's one limitation. Okay, so making LLMs bigger and training them on more data is not going to get them to reach human intelligence. Even if some, if in some narrow areas they already seem super intelligent, actually superhuman, in some level performance. We have superhuman perform, uh, performance for things like uh, translation of you know, hundreds of languages in any direction, uh, or um, uh, image recognition for, for various applications. It's, it's superhuman. So those are narrow domains, and uh, the latest techniques in LLM do not change that, uh, that thing. So we have AI systems now that can pass the bar exam, um, which is mostly information retrieval. Um, but we still don't have level five autonomous driving, something, a task that any 17 year old can learn in about 20 hours of practice. We still don't have domestic robot that can you know, clear up the dinner table and fill up the dishwasher a task that any 10-year-old can learn in, in minutes. Uh, so what it tells you is that we're missing something really big in the AI to kind of reach uh, not just human intelligence, even dog intelligence. But an AI, a large language model, can explain how to clear the dinner table, and it can, in fact, probably do it better than your average 10-year-old or 20-year-old. It can't do that because dexterity is hard, but that's a separate problem. Explain to me why language is limited, right? So I listen to you, and I hear the words, and I process them, and I also see the gestures, right? And I have some sense from the room which provides context and information, and I see how Jacques is responding. All of those things are outside of the text, so I understand that. But all of those things can be put into text, so why can't an infinitely powerful language processor approximate all of these different streams of information? So not everything can be put into text. If everything can be put into text, then you could become, let's say, a surgeon or a doctor by just reading books, and you can. You could become a mechanic by just reading books, and you can. You could learn to build, I don't know, anything out of wood by just reading books, and you can. You have to practice. You have to have someone that teaches you. And so there's a lot of skills that include planning uh, that require uh, you know, any, any task that you do consciously, essentially, uh, uh, require you to have a mental model of the world, uh, which includes the, the kind of physical qualities of the world, and we acquire those models, uh, we form them in our, in our prefrontal cortex when we're babies. We learn how the world works when we're babies by watching the world go by and then interacting with it uh, and, and learning new skills. Uh, LLMs do not, cannot do this. They, they don't have any sort of high bandwidth perception of what goes on in the world at the moment. So, of course, what people are working on including me, is, uh, and, and people working with me at, uh, at Meta, uh, is providing a new generation of AI system with this ability to learn uh, from video, for example, to learn how the world works with video. If you, if you take a, a five-month-old baby and you show, you show them a, a sort of made-up scenario where there is an object that appears to float in the air, they barely pay attention to it. But if you show this to a 10-month-old baby, the baby will look at it like, and be very, very surprised and have big eyes looking at this. 
object from in the air. And it's because in the meantime, around the edge of nine months, uh, human babies learn about gravity. They learn that objects are not supposed to float in the air, they're supposed to fall. That takes nine months. We have no idea how to reproduce this capacity of the machines today. Until we can't do this, um, we're not going to have human level intelligence, we're not going to have dog level or cat level intelligence. So that's the missing part. And it's much more difficult, it turns out, to train a machine to learn how it works by watching video than it is to train a machine to be fluent by uh, training it on text and, and training it to predict the next word.